Attorney General Jeff Sessions has announced an approach that is reminiscent of a more traditional law and order effort on criminal justice. Skeptics have said that method has not been effective in the past, and the reforms are needed rather than a return to the past. One of those is Arthur Reiser. He's National Security and Justice Policy Director for the R Institute, a libertarian group based in Washington, D.C., and he's with me to talk about changes he'd like to see, particularly in the areas of jail reform. Arthur, what do you think of Attorney General Sessions' plan to return to that so-called law and order approach? We've tried the mass incarceration model, you know, from 1982 on, basically, and it hasn't really made us safer. Yes, crime rates are, are going down, but it's not because we're jailing more people. It's because we've actually taken systematic approaches in how we address crime. And even though that we might see a, a, you know, an uptick in violent crimes this year, which is probably likely, it's very concentrated in a couple of neighborhoods, in a couple of cities. But overall crime is you know, the lowest that we've seen for, like, generations. And so I think that we have to take a, a hard look on being smart on crime rather than hard on crime. One of the things that I know work is taking a systematic approach to how we deal with people who are mentally ill within the criminal justice system or people who have impoverished within the criminal justice system. And more days in jail don't actually help us. In fact, we know that the longer you spend in jail when you're a low-risk individual, the more likely you are to actually commit more crimes. Now, why is that? Well, because you rip them away from their families. You take them away from their jobs. What actually lowers crime rate is you know, deflection programs within the system, ensuring that people who are truly evildoers you know, serve time and we remove them from society. But people who are low-level drug dealers, low-level drug users, by having a deflection program or diversion program in a way that we can remove them from the system and give them help actually lowers crime because we're keeping them engaged within their community, within America. And I know that sounds cheesy, but that really is what works. Where do you think specialty courts fit in on this? Because people have given a lot of credit to that so that you have certain people who are not, let's say, made bankrupt by a minor violation. I, I think specialty courts are amazing. I, I do think that we should have one step before specialty courts. I think having the, the idea that specialty courts can fix everything, I don't actually agree with. I think that we should actually have, you know, that's a diversion program, but you're already in the system when you're in a specialty court. I think we should have, you know, if you look at some of the, the programs we see in uh, Seattle, for instance, um, you, you actually have a deflection program. So before you're even booked, there's a way to push you kind of out of the system and into treatment. And this is, works particularly well with homeless people and, you know, drug users. But specialty courts, you know, there's, there's a reason that those exist. You know, there, some of the ones that are the most effective are drug courts, obviously, but also some of the veterans courts, because that's all that, you know, be honest, if you, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a veteran of the uh, Iraq war. I went as a reservist, um, and I was in Fallujah. And I, I, I know for a fact that if we look at the way that those individuals, uh, in, you know, come back and they're broken mentally, so having a, a court that can understand that and can work with them and doesn't destroy their lives. We really have to rethink the way we approach individuals within the criminal justice system. And if we destroy somebody's life, we can't be surprised when they just don't want to be part of our community. Who's benefiting from the current system, doing it this other way when it comes to nonviolent offenders? Why is the system set up this way still in many ways? Well, I think that politicians love to rally around this. I think that it is just you know, a self-looking ice cream cone where they can just perpetuate their, 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 their own existence by being, you know, hard on crime. Um, I also think that there's some institutions that benefit from this. I mean, if you look at the, the groups that, for instance, that really rally against bail reform, and I'm not, I'm not talking about getting rid of cash bail in its entirety, but, you know, moving to a system that looks more at risk, because that's what bail is all about. It's about looking at somebody's risk and then make a determination whether or not they're going to be out pre-trial. And let's not forget that pre-trial individuals are actually innocent. So that's the group we're talking about. 60% of people in jail right now are actually legally innocent. And the only reason that they're in jail, a lot of them, is because they can't afford bail. But somebody who's actually dangerous and can afford bail gets out, that is, that, that is just backwards. So, 
you know, if you look at the groups that rally against those, it's, they're the kind of the obvious, you know, players, the people that their job security kind of surrounds this. So you have um, a lot of prosecutors groups, the, the individuals who benefit from the status quo, obviously are the ones that want to push the status quo. Arthur Reiser is National Security and Justice Policy Director for the R Institute, a libertarian group based in Washington, D.C.